Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. And I challenge you. Are you a Christian in name only and yet you're rebelling against God? Are, are, are you in a place here to where your heart is actually submitted to God? Or are you still toying around with your own pride, your own ego, your own things, and doing things your own way? Has somebody brought the gospel message to you front and center to realize that God is saying, listen, man, I want to give you something good, but it's your life. You get to choose what you want to do. You can go left, you can go right, you can do what you want to do. Taking the cross for us, no greater love. Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Have you ever wondered where your family originated from? Does that have an effect on the way you live? Today we can take a DNA test to understand our family tree and ancestry. In the Old Testament, these family origins were recorded in the book of Genesis, which shows how all of humanity came from one family, even after the cataclysmic flooding of the whole earth. As we read through the biblical genealogies, we can oftentimes get lost in the names and pronunciations. But if we look deeper, we can see the link from the beginning of time to the last days and the tribulation period. These early chapters in Genesis suddenly become significant in our lives today. Let's dive in with Pastor Jeff in a message titled, God's Unfolding Plan. Okay, and, and, and so because we know what his name means, in fact, you might have a study Bible that just says that right there in the footnote of your Bible. But it's rebellion against God. And it says that he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. And we might get that idea, oh, he's a mighty hunter before God and, and all of this stuff. But what we don't realize is because we're reading it from the English, is that the word before in Hebrew literally means against. The word that is here for this. And we see, uh, this this word is a tricky word, so if you look it up in Strong's, you're gonna have like 20 some odd definitions of this thing. Uh, And you gotta find the right one that goes here. And scholars do a real good job of laying those things out. I'm just gonna advance it for you really fast. Again, it just literally means against the Lord. So Nimrod, his name means rebellion against God. He was a mighty hunter against the Lord. And now what does this guy do? Verse number 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was uh, Babel or Babel, however you want to pronounce it. And and then it defines the location where that is in. Okay, so this is describing here in uh, Babylon. Okay, so this is the general area with the different cities kind of going up and down the, uh, the waterway there and all that stuff. Um, and so this is what he did. This is what he established. Uh, if you've got a good Bible in your hand, it might tell you that the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom is started in the land of Shinar. That's really the accurate version in, in, in really pinpointing it here as opposed to Babylon because Babylon has kind of given you an expanded region. Shinar is dropping that, that little map point on it and saying, boom, it's right here. Here's the GPS location on this, if you will. And he does this building project. Now, now, now take your Bible and move ahead once again to chapter 11. Because we're still dealing with this middle son. We're still dealing with this rebellious son. We're still dealing with, with Ham and, and, and the uh, descendants that came from him. And, and as we're on Nimrod, chapter 11, the first nine verses opens up with this guy. He tells us this stuff. Let me read a couple of them to you. It says, now uh, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found the plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come and and let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had um, brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. So we are on the backside of the world being repopulated after a great what? After a great flood. So what was the scare factor of the day? Another flood. flood. It was water. And, and, And they're changing the traditional building project here and they're using pitch. Think about it. Think about this. With, with, with Nimrod being at the helm of this, he's saying, listen, I've got an ingenious way. We're going to do this. We're going to waterproof this sucker. So sort of that crazy God in the sky again starts to do these things, we can deliver ourselves. We're going to make a great name for ourselves. And this literally is part of the thinking that goes on. And, and, and we might laugh about the drama I put, up, put behind it, but yet don't we do the same thing in our own time in 2023? 
You know, we try to outthink and outmaneuver God with the plans that we want to put in place. Oh, man, I blew it then. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this and then do that. Listen, God has his way of getting beyond and getting through all the stuff, as we'll see even in this right here. So he keeps going down. At verse number four, it says, and they said, come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose tops is in the heaven uh, and, and, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so, man, they're, they're working. They're trying to do something here. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which uh, the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. They all have one language. And this is what they began to do. So, so, so as we read through it, we can maybe miss the pointedness that God is saying. You, you remember back at the fall of Adam and Eve, you know, God told them not to do something with that tree that was in the middle of the garden. Don't eat from that tree. They did, and then they hid themselves, okay? And, and so God comes strolling in in the cool of the day. Hey, Adam, where you at, man? What, you know, what's going on? So, so the same concept is here. For, for, for God is a personal God. He's not a distance, unknowable God. We know that because we have his word. We know that because the Holy Spirit is presence with those that are believers in Jesus Christ. If you give your life to Christ, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You sense the Holy Spirit within you. Listen, when you pray, all of a sudden you sense, oh, man, I, I, I just felt like I visited with God. I felt like God was speaking to me, right? I mean, he's a personal and a knowable God. And if you, can, if you can understand that by looking into this, the God is checking this out and he's going, what in the world? And he says, man, we're, I'm just allowing them to repopulate the earth right now and to be fruitful and to multiply. And this is what they began to do. They began to build this work that stretches into the heavens to try to outmaneuver and to outstretch. Oh, yeah, and it gets even worse than that. What else? Well, because of these particular things of, of building this tower, they were, they, they were these ziggurats. You probably, you know, some of you that are much smarter than I am, you, you understand the, the terrace level of building and all that stuff. But here's the point. On each one of those, those terraces, they were built for pagan deities to worship anything but the true and living God. And that's why that whole entire thing of the Tower of Babylon and, and, and everything that God is doing as it was coming underneath of, of Nimrod, coming out of his ingenuity and his, his brain power, if you will, is, is leading all of this. Verse seven, God says, come and let us go down and, and there confuse their language that they might not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of, the, of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel or Babel uh, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all of the earth. We'll stop right at that. So we've got man's attempt here to reach God. This is what they were doing. Can you remember with me for just a moment? Can you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse nine? Take a look at the screen with me. This is what Jesus said. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, now, the promises of God is they're starting all the way back here at the beginning of the Bible and pointing forward. You and I, we, we have the privilege of looking back through the corridors of time, back through the corridors of Bible history, world history, and all of this stuff. And we can remember these things that Jesus said. That, that, that we ourselves are not trying to muster up these particular works to try to reach an unknowable God. But rather, we're coming to the grips of the reality with our own sinfulness and realizing that, God, forgive me. God, please have mercy upon me as a sinner. God, please extend your grace to me. I accept the work that you've done. Jesus said that he's the door, that he's the way. He's the only one that can do this. And, and, and you and I, again, we can look back through these things and we say, man, what a lame attempt. What a lame attempt of these people trying to go and, and, and to meet reach their way up and to worship a God that is already a knowable God, a God that is already, he wants to be there within our life. And how many of our friends and families and perhaps even us at times, we absolutely resist God. We struggle with these things. And, and, and man, I don't want this to be a, a big Debbie Downer type of a study here, but I do want us to understand and to take away, extract out of the Old Testament scriptures. Again, we're just moving through some history here, some genealogies. I just want us to understand in a very simple capacity here that God is a knowable God. And if we're just trying to attempt to reach God on our own good works, we're going to fail miserably. Now, it has been said this way because we're still dealing with this area of Shinar, Babylon. Uh, take a look at the screen. Shinar is significant 
in its connection to the world's historical rebellion against God. That's where all this stuff is happening. And I want you to understand that, again, if you've got a good Bible, it should be transferred as Shinar and not just, uh, not just Babylon. The idea is Babylon, but it's more specific than that, okay? And if we can understand this, as we navigate and we move through the course of time, we move just a little bit farther ahead in, in this time. We see the law is given. We see that Moses dies. We see Joshua comes on the scene. and We see the beginning of the conquest begin to happen. I think we have this verse on the screen for us. Uh, Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. Take a look at the screen right here, okay? Joshua chapter 7. It says, when I, when I saw among the spoils, now this is Achan, okay? This is guy, this is one of the dudes that was in the, um, uh, the Israelite family of God. And they were on a conquest to take territory, right? Okay, and, and, and this guy, Achan, he's impacted by this. He says, I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian, this is Shinar, garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. Now I coveted them and I, I, I took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. The impact of what spilled out from the very inception, the very early times of, of, of when, when the earth was being repopulated after the flood, after Noah, coming through the three sons of Noah, that the, 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 the sting that is going on that's spilling out of Shinar, Babylon, bigger picture here, is taking place here. We move a little bit farther here. We see this in Hosea, Hosea chapter 10. So we're moving from this time of about the 14th century BC and we move forward now to about 767, 20 BC, Hosea. He says, how prosperous Israel is, a luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. But the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build. The more bountiful their harvest, the more beautiful their sacred pillars. He says, the hearts of the people are fickle. And I'll stop right there at that. The hearts of the people are, 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 are fickle. Well, what are we recognizing here? And what am I pointing out? I'm just pointing out to you the destructive nature of what spilled out and it continues to move forward and continues to move forward and continues to move forward. And that is the wrestle. Either God's gonna lead or the desires of my own humanity is going to lead. There is no two other two ways to follow. That is it. We come a little bit farther through the course of, of history. I won't put this on the screen here. We got Zechariah chapter five, verses one through 11. We're in this area of about 520 BC um, that, that the Babylonian captivity has just ended. Uh, we've taught you guys a lot on this Babylonian captivity. You should be able to understand that by now, that 70 years where the, where the uh, children of Israel, where they were taken to Babylon. The 70 years has ended. Now they're returning. They've returned to Jerusalem. And, and, and as they came back, from that Babylonian captivity, as they were in that culture for 70 years, they also brought back with them a desire for great commercialism, and it stirred their hearts away from God. What does that mean to you and I here today? Well, it means something very simple. Take a look at the screen. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's all pointing somewhere, so stick with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says this. He says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That we bring trouble upon ourselves when we lose focus and we begin to go after something that can't sustain me. This was happening. And God dealt with them through the chorus of centuries. Long time. God was dealing with them hundreds of years, thousands of years here, okay? And, and, and as he was working with them, and, and, and even now as they were so close to understanding the story uh, you know, hearing the firsthand uh, 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 retelling of the story, you know, coming down from Noah and all this stuff, still the inclination of the individual heart is to turn away from God. As we move farther into the New Testament, springing out of all that Old Testament stuff, we come now to the time after the rapture of the church happens and we look into the tribulation period. And in Revelation chapter 17, here's what we find, verses uh, five to six. In fact, uh, they'll throw it on the screen, but I want to look at it in my Bible here. So Revelation 17, verse five to six. Here's, here's what we got. It says, it says on her uh, forehead, a name was written. What's that name? Mysterious Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So we've got the personification of evil happening that, that is sprung out of a particular area in world history. Now watch, again, the personification of a woman. He says, I, I saw the woman, this is Babylon, 
drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Tribulation saints. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So, so in the New Testament, we have the apostle John receiving a revelation from, from God and, and in the book of Revelation, singular, that, that, that he pens this down here, chapter 17 and also in chapter 18 in a second, he pens this down of going back to Shinar, back to Babylon and understanding the evil plots and plans that spilled out of that. And, and who are they inspired by? Watch, Revelation 18, one to three now. Here's what it says. It says, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried with a, a, a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Here's the idea, don't miss it, it's very easy. As we, as we navigate through all of this stuff, we must understand, we must recognize and realize that, that, that when we choose to do this life without God, without accepting the gift of a personable, knowable God, of a God that has, has extended grace and mercy to anybody that would accept it, anybody that would receive it, anybody that would, that would turn from their own way and turn to his ways, anybody that would do that, and yet what the Bible paints and it portrays from Old Testament to New Testament, from the repopulation under Noah all the way down here to the, to the end of, of Revelation, we find that anything that comes out of Babylon is just filled and it's inspired by Satan. And we know this, that Satan tactics is to kill, steal, and destroy. He doesn't want anybody going to heaven, nobody at all. That's what he wants. And he gets into our time, and let's just deal with us as a fellowship or, or 2023, uh, the church age, okay, the, the, the age of grace, okay? The, 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 the Satan is ripping people off right now. And he's trying to take them to hell. And you and I, or, or should I say, should I, should I just back out a little and say, the body of Christ that we are God's instruments on earth standing in the way to bring gospel truth, to teach God's word, to show that there is two paths to walk. One ends up here in a lake of fire. The other one ends up in eternity in heaven with God. There's two ways to go about this. And, 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 And every man, woman, and child gets an opportunity to choose what that looks like. And yes, God does give that opportunity to every single man, woman, and child. And you guys are really spoiled because you're Americans. And so, man, it's, it's, it, it has, in days gone by, it's been woven into the fabric of this country, but it's being eradicated with step by step and generation by generation. And now the younger generations that are coming up, who is God? You know, we're, we're, we're back to a godless society. And I just want you to understand that we either accept God's ways or we trade God's ways for the way of self. And that's what was happening with Ham's first son. He had Cush. Cush gave birth to Nimrod. Nimrod was in that place of rebellion against God. Do you realize that he heard firsthand these stories coming from his great-grandfather Noah about what God did, about the amazing things that God did? Do you imagine the stories that come out of Noah? I was in the ark, and I just heard all this screaming and all these people out there yelling, and God didn't let me open the door. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, you have a story too, right? And I realize that's a little dramatic, but, uh, but, but listen, 21, 22 years ago, right? You know, do you remember where you were on 9-11? I mean, that's just an impact moment for our country, right? For, for, for some of you that are old enough to remember that, it was a dramatic impact in our country. And we can retell those stories to our grandchildren and all that stuff. And they may not get the, they, they may not feel the, the full boost of that impact moment. But this impact moment, that was a global deal. That was a global thing. And, and man, some of these guys heard this and, and still Nimrod, again, his name means rebellion against God. He chose to go a different way. And I challenge you, are you a Christian in name only and yet you're rebelling against God? Are, are, are you in a place here to where your heart is actually submitted to God? Or are you still toying around with your own pride, your own ego, your own things and doing things your own way? Has somebody brought the gospel message to you front and center to realize that God is saying, listen, man, I want to give you something good, but it's your life. You get to choose what you want to do. 
You can go left, you can go right, you can do what you want to do. And I'm so proud of, of many, many, many of you. I've had the opportunity to disciple you. I've had the opportunity to take many of you to Israel. I've had the opportunity to be in your, in your lives for the, uh, you know, in this post-pandemic era, right? The church was virtually all new post-pandemic. So we're a young church. We're only two years old. <laughs> how special is that? Oh, that's, that's just how it went, right? All right, let's be, let's be super fast with this, okay? Idea number three, and this is the capstone on this, okay? Uh, idea number three is the promise revealed. Uh, this is uh, Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 10, and it just kind of flows out the chapter. Uh, maybe I'll touch more on it next time. Um, but for argument's sake, let's just keep it simple for just a second, okay? Um, by show of hands, has anybody ever heard of Ancestry.com? Show of hands if you've done that. Okay, uh, most of you have, awesome. You know, this is where this uh, DNA test comes from to connect us to our past, if, if you will. Uh, I've actually done it, you know, a few years ago. Uh, actually, somebody bought it for me a few years ago, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And you, you spit in that little tube and send it away, and then they tell you where you came from and all that. So it's, it's interesting to, to see perhaps where uh, uh, some of your ancestors has, has um, uh, migrated through. Uh, my woman's a purebred. Um, I'm not. I seem to be a mixture of a few things along the way, maybe many things along the way. And so I guess a different story for a different day. Uh, but I want you to follow the thought, uh, if you could. Again, that Ancestry.com thought, if you could just, just understand that. Um, you know, and, and move it into the genealogy, because we're here at another aspect of genealogy as, as chapter 11 closes out. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're continuing down with Shem, right? He's the oldest son, and that's, that's normally where the storyline follows through. And so it's very interesting that in chapter 10 of Genesis, that that whole storyline was reversed. It did the youngest son first. Right? Because it normally comes from the oldest son. And so, again, as we're here in chapter 11, uh, verse 10, and kind of down, this is the gene- genealogy of Shem. Here's, here's, the, here's the, the storyline, if, if you can receive it that way. All we're seeing is the storyline, is, is that it, it goes from Noah. Uh, we can make a little quick stop if we want to talk about Eber for a second and say, hey, here's where the name Hebrew came from. Cool, whatever. Uh, but, but, but really, it flows down to Abram, who becomes Abraham, Right? And then it goes, goes through his sons and, and uh, you know, as, as his son, I should say. And then as it's passed down and the 12 tribes and everything has come forward from there. Here's the pro tip. Take your Bible, flip it ahead to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. Just, just recognize this. Again, we're just, we're just doing an Ancestry.com thing here. That's all we're doing. We're just following the track of, of, the, uh, of the genealogy. And as we move in to uh, the New Testament... Uh, I'll use one. We've got two, two different uh, um, tracks or traces of genealogy that we could use for Jesus. I'll use this one only because it's divided out. So in Matthew chapter 1, we get this line um, that is coming down. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we see this goes all the way down to verse number 6. We've got 14 generations there, okay? We move on down, and we pick up in verse number 7, and takes us all the way through uh, verse 11, okay? We've got another block of 14 generations. We pick up in verse number 12, uh, roughly, and we move it all the way down uh, verse 16, okay? Uh, Another 14 generations, and then right here in verse number 17 is the summation of all of this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. We got a total of 42 generations there. I'll get more into that when we get into First Chronicles. I'll kind of show you how that arcs through in a very cool study. But suffice it to say here for tonight, we're out of time. I just want you to understand that the promise is being revealed here. And as we pick up next week, we'll move into Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Again, we're gonna carve out uh, real close to 10 chapters here in this. And we're going to see that very first promise as it begins to come forward as it was given to Abraham and the impact and the effect uh, that it has had down through the plan of God through the ages. Amen? That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 1030 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are located in Westminster, Colorado on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway. 
near the Vasa Fitness. If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless. Thank you.